Welcome to Creator Logs, where I build worlds and show you how. Cellar Path is... well, it's actually already out, I released it a while ago now. It's an extreme demon that took me over 450 hours to make. Anyway, you probably already know about this level, I hope, so let's go ahead and hop into one final mega episode where I retrospectively finish this beast. Creative block. It's real, and I definitely struggled with it with this first part. Nonetheless, I went ahead and just tried things. Sometimes the best way to come up with ideas is just to put something, really anything, down. This is what I came up with, and I mean, well, it's okay. It's not really what I wanted, but it gave me something. It gave me a start. I decided to start fresh, but take inspiration from what was working here. I'll get to that in a minute. For a start, this background had to go. The part right before this is one of the most intense parts of the level. Keeping the background open and distant helps create a dramatic feeling. That part is over though, and the level settles down a bit, so there's a couple ways I wanted to accentuate that. First, this new background is much, much closer to the player, creating a more cozy, closed-in feeling. Yeah, it's a lot more basic, but I wanted most of the detail to come from the block design, so it's no big deal. Speaking of the block design, here's what I came up with. Keeping some pieces from what I scrapped, I mixed in these brick structures and they really made the part feel a lot more inviting with their softer shape, plus they're easier to make. Another detail worth mentioning is these red bits on the rocks. I used these rocks for both spikes and slopes. To make it clear which is which, I added this red glow to the spikes and added some soft moss to all the slopes. Alright, so this climate control panel thingy might feel like a bit of a weird choice. Not sure if I ever explained this, but the plan for the end of this level is to break into the Jam Factory's vault from below. Hey guys, it's like the other level I made. That's pretty crazy. Anyway, I wanted to start introducing little details, hinting that the Jam Factory has been here, preserving and studying the runes around you. Well, that went on for a bit. Let's move on to the details. Here's the main thing that inspired me for this part. So, have you ever played Minecraft with those, uh, just those really overbearingly orange shaders? Well, combine that with the game's lush caves, and you got something pretty cozy. While this old part feels cold and distant, I wanted this version to feel warm and close. I started to add in that rich orange light I talked about with these torches that are totally not copied from an earlier part. Hey, work smart, not dumb. I also added some crumbly brick walls to make the top structures feel supported. Comfort the Wall approves this decision. I added some hanging roots and some hanging vines, kind of like I did with earlier parts, just tying the theme together. And yeah, it's time to add some depth. Some stuff in the foreground really helped this part feel a lot more 3D without covering up any important gameplay. Personally, I really like this flower design. I kind of just came up with it by messing around. You copy and paste this rock slope objects a few times, rotating at 45 degrees and increasing its Z order each time. I made some of these slopes rotate back and forth at an offset to look like they're blowing in the wind. Another cool effect is with these vines in the foreground. I was inspired by these awesome chains in the opening for Attack on Titan, so I made something that looks far worse. Still, by copying and pasting low opacity objects like this, I created a sort of motion blur effect, which I think looks kinda cool. And to finish this part off, you know what time it is. With a few blending overlays, including this gradient, I made the orangish light from the torches a lot stronger. I also made these overlays flicker the same way the torches do. I obviously used a lot more of these particle objects, why wouldn't I, and finally added a vignette on the borders. This helps the part feel a lot more closed in. I also put a second one in the background that's even more closed in. This makes it look like the foreground light is fading out as it goes back. Alright, we got a lot of parts to get through, so I'll have to speed this up a bit. To start, I wanted this transition to feel connected. On one side, I built this stained glass window, and on the other, I copied and flipped it. By using a bunch of blending slopes and particles, I made a pretty cool breaking glass effect that syncs to the cymbal crash in the song. Now, like with the last part, I'll start with the background. This time, there's a little more going on. We got a base texture on these walls, and on top of that, we have these windows. I made these by layering some blending slopes in a cool pattern. This was inspired by the geometric design you find in mosques. Now, these arches. These were a lot of fun to make. Each layer gets a bit smaller and represents what an actual slice of these 3D shapes would look like. 
Moving them just took some simple parallax, nothing crazy. Getting them aligned like this though, well, let me show you a cool trick. Ever wondered what this line in the editor is for? Well, when scrolling, it represents the player's position, so it'll set off triggers and stuff. Pretty useful. When you hit this play button though, it acts a little bit different. Now it shows the center of your screen. Any parallax you made should be perfectly aligned on this line. So just hit playtest, wait until it reaches where you want the 3D object to be, pause the game, and align every layer to that line. It's insanely useful and can be used for a lot of other things too. That's how I did this effect at least. Alright, let's move on from the background to structuring. You might or might not know what it means, basically, these are all structures, and their different structuring is what sets them apart. A lot of newer creators go with really basic rectangles as structuring, but it's a good idea to get a little more creative. Why I'm saying that is because this here might just be my favorite structuring I have made ever in the history of creating, and boy was it a puzzle to figure out. <laughs> It's all got a nice flow to it, and each structure fits together really nicely. Plus, it's just really cool to look at. The block design is pretty basic. The use of black with bright reds and purples makes this part look pretty dramatic. I had a really cool idea for the block design using scaled up spikes, but the hitboxes didn't like me, so these are a bit of a scuffed workaround. This ground spike deco looks pretty cool and also helps the hazard stand out. Okay, we really gotta pick up some pace here. Here's a rose vine design using the rock outline meta. No, I will not stop using these things for literally everything. Some more vines and chains in the front add depth. This is how I blurred the chains. Yeah, it's a pretty cool trick. These rotating saws also made some cool details throughout the part. It's a little hard to see, but I have some giant ones coming out of the ground, sort of like a dark, creeping magic. Finally, RTX on and stuff, yada yada, we got some blending overlays. I put some glow behind the dark structures, and that makes them a little easier to see. I also put some spinning black glow over everything, and that looks pretty cool. One detail I really like are these floating runes that flash to the music. They help add some life and energy, along with even more particles I added. Dude, I'm too obsessed with these things, it's like it's a genuine problem. Alright, let's move on to the second half of this part. This wall right here, it's actually based off of a real wall that I took a picture of. Why be creative when you can just steal the work of other designers? To be fair though, I love the way this background looks, and it's okay to take inspiration from other things if you're adding your own twist on them. The icons are replaced with dark silhouettes and cultish symbols. Oh yeah, there's also these two rainbow blocks that Mpika dared me to put in this part. Funny enough, this art might just look better with them. The block design isn't quite as interesting, though it's still cool. But first, let's talk about callbacks. So, you know this one part in Future Funk 2? Uh, that's a callback. New home in Undertale, callback. A callback is basically something that uses elements from earlier with some changes. It helps put things into context. It uses familiarity to show you how far you've come, and how much things have changed. It helps tie a world together. I really like this block design from the workshop earlier on, and for this part I did something similar. The tile set is a little different, and so are a lot of its details, but there's a lot of things these parts have in common. The structuring is pretty similar, we've got these gears that rotate to the beat, there's the use of chains, and these wood beams holding it all together. To detail all this, I added some more rose vines and glow. I want this part to feel similar to the last one, but still change things up a bit, so they share a few details like these. There's also these cloth mats that I added for a splash of color. And with that extra color, we could also use some more motion. To finish this part off, I had a really cool idea for an effect. It actually casts bigger shapes on the background than on the gameplay. I did this by using what I like to call stencil masking. I didn't invent it, and I don't know who did or what it's actually called, but it's a really cool effect. By placing down blending or low opacity objects, then making an inverse of them a couple Z layers below, the pattern turns invisible till we put something between the two layers. After that, I just made some larger squares under everything and moved them at the same time. I love the atmosphere this adds. This part just feels so much more alive now. There's some strange moving lights from somewhere behind you, and I can't help but wonder exactly what they are. And that brings us to the magic source. A radiant grove of crystalline pillars sprawled across a boundless cavern. Yeah, that'll do. I wanted to take some inspiration from the crystal peaks in Hollow Knight since they always stood out to me. 
in a good way. My original plan was something more like this part in Undertale, but it didn't really work out with all the tight, dense gameplay of a level this hard. Actually, making a level this hard proved a big challenge for that reason. It felt really limiting with the gameplay I made in what decoration could work, and for that reason I don't really want to make another extreme anytime soon. But with that said, this part still turned out really cool. To start off, we've got another seamless transition. This time, I made a cool geode that cuts off the wall in the part before. I used my signature move, parallax, obviously, but I'm more interested in this design. This whole bit only uses 65 objects. I used a bunch of these default rocks mixed in with ground spike deco layered in a way that looks super shiny. One of my favorite low object designs I've made for sure. The background though, it wasn't exactly what I'd call low object. It had over like 2000 objects. It looked really cool, don't get me wrong, but when I started adding block design, the frame rate got pretty bad. On top of that, you couldn't even see most of what's here once I added the gameplay, so I simplified it a lot. These crystals pulse to the music in a way that gives a lot of personality. Also, this blurry background, if you can even see it, is made up of just a few scale-hacked triangles. And, as you can see, when I add the block design, it really does cover up most of this background, so keeping it simple was a good idea. I continued to be creative with my structuring, breaking up big chunks into smaller shapes. I used crystals like the ones in the background as spikes, and embedded some in the ground as well. And here's some more details. I added some crystals in front of everything too, and this ground made of... Well, we don't talk about that one. These extra bits of ground in front help add some more depth, and these beams in the back make the part feel more supported. Lastly, it's the joke that keeps on giving. I made this glow strip by copying and pasting blending squares and increasing their brightness by 0.1 each time. Then I took a 0.1 brightness glow piece and blended each layer together. This is the same thing I did back here. This gradient overlay makes the colors pop, and finally, there's some cool fog I made by moving these rock tiles on low opacity blending. And that's it for this part. It's time for the finale. The Gaping Mines. Well, they really didn't end up being very gaping exactly, but this is the climax of the level and I wanted it to feel as intense as possible. There are three ways I want to do that. Fast speed, intense, fiery colors, and bringing life to all the details. So to start off, we have these wood structures and dirt mounds. Anyway, shout out to Yorid, who might as well build this level for me at this point. He had this idea for these ground spikes, where I layer another one behind to make it a lot brighter for a metallic look, and yeah. Dude knows what he's doing. These look sick. One thing I did come up with though, all by myself, were these fans. I used this pinwheel object and copied it for some highlights and shadows. These fans have a stupid low object count, like seriously. There's also a couple callbacks in this part. I wanted to take pieces from all the others and tie them together into a finale. To start, here's some spike pillars that move in the same way that these ones in the city did. And these gears are similar to the ones in the workshop and chapel. Also more mushrooms. Could never forget those. Speaking of reusing assets, never thought you'd see these again. But Jam, you shouldn't put torches in an actual mine. They- Yes, I know! And that's exactly why this whole part is going down in flame. Can't imagine what goober put those there, but someone's getting a pay cut. Also, here's the cobwebs from earlier. I'm sure the spiders are doing great and not experiencing mini California. Of course, every mine needs minecarts. It's practically raining them here. Don't think that's supposed to happen. I got some Jam Factory branding on these. They've definitely been here. You're getting close. Alright, intensity. I said I wanted this part to feel intense, and intense it shall be. The strong colors are helping, but another way to do that is with a sense of speed. Here's a ground and some supports moving past the player very quickly. There's also some flying debris made of basic objects. Nice and stressful, just like all duels at the end of an over 2 minute level should be. But we're not done, things can get crazier. One thing these particles are really good for is sparks and embers. I made them fly all over the part, but what I'm really interested in is the effect of these sparks on these gears. It's a little complicated how I made them do this, but basically I used a combination of follow triggers and the use target option on move triggers. I have these X's rotating around sporadically, and every beat, these circles move to where they last were with use target. Then they reset to their original position after. 
I use follow triggers to make every bunch of sparks follow the same movements, and I pulse them so that they disappear before they reset. If none of that made sense, that is totally understandable. I've also got little details like this platform that stutters into place, did this with some rotate and follow triggers. Stuff like this and those sparks seem trivial, but they're what give your worlds that extra layer of life. That extra layer that makes them seem almost real. So, now this part has the energy it needs to succeed. You really don't want to ignore that part. One example I have is Smarties Preferably by Substra and more. This level looks sick, but the drop is just underwhelming. The song is so intense, but this part doesn't use any of the tricks I've showed, except maybe the colors, and it feels slow and stagnant as a result. It's also a matter of context. This drop works because the parts leading up to it were holding back and letting this one shine. In Smarties preferably, every part is just as intense. So I don't mean to call out some random level, I just thought it would be a good example. I hope we're good, uh, Substra. Anyway, intensity was one of my two goals. Like I said earlier, my other one was to tie in every part before this into a big climax. There's just one more way I want to do that. The first drop in this level is entirely white on black, and that makes it stand out. This part isn't, and it would look pretty ugly if I did that anyway, but instead I added these pulses that reference the first drop and I think it looks kinda sick. It also adds even more energy, and I can't have too much of that. Finally, we reach one last black and white transition. You have to hold as the wave to break this grate. Letting go before you break it will prompt you with this message that people never seem to read. Oh well, that brings us to the last five jumps. One final stress test, before it's all over. So first things first, I'm having a lot of fun stealing Impika's brick design from his part in Mackinal. The block design back here was inspired by it, and so are these structures now. Other than that, this part shares a lot in common with the first part in the level. It's another callback. I wanted this level to come full circle, to tie everything together. However, I didn't just copy and paste the first part. I have improved since Autumn Travel. Anyway, that's why I've got these brick structures for a start. It's enough to make this part feel different, but yeah, most of it's just copied from the first part. It's not much, but it's dishonest work. The background was changed up a little bit more though. I wanted this part to feel like the foundations under the vault that you're about to break into. Reference images can help a lot if you don't know how something looks. This image was my main go-to. Anyway, here's what I got. I've got mounds of dirt like in the first part and these wood beams and concrete holding everything up. That's one sturdy vault. Finally, with some glow and chains over everything, this part feels a lot more closed in. It's time to break free, the light at the end of the tunnel is right the- Oh. Yeah, my uh, my patron Cloudman made me add this, blame him. It happens if you die to this last click in just the right way. If you wanna add secrets like this to my levels, then too bad. Secrets of this size just aren't realistic to add for every patron now, but that just means I have a lot more of you guys and I really appreciate it. It means a lot. You can still hide a small secret in my future levels though, like some text or a custom object. You can also play my levels at any point for $5 a month, or play them early for only one a month. Okay, yeah, you get the point. Give me your money, that's all. Hand it over. What were we talking about? Oh yeah, my level. Alright, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. For real this time. I would tell you how I made this end screen, but I don't feel like it. A couple cool things to point out though, these gold piles are definitely made of real ethical gold. Also this cube animation is cool, that took hours to get right, I've got no clue how creators make shit like this, it blows my mind. Well, that's the video, the patron list in the level end screen is a little out of date so here they are instead. The support really does mean a lot to me. It means I can spend more time doing stuff like this, and this is a lot more fun than fast food. Seriously, literally anything is. Love y'all, and I'll see you later. Have a good one, guys.